Hi everybody, we are um, having another CCC web session. This time it will be much less on web technologies, but it will be equally important. This one is about standards. We are talking about standards. We will talk about what are standards, why they are useful, where we get them from, and how all of that works. The first very important bit to remember is that standards are agreements. Standards are a human created thing. So here we have the kilogram. This thing, this metal thing inside the glass is the kilogram. Well, used to be they have redefined the standard with uh, some numbers of some atoms. But until quite recently, actually, around the world in around seven places, there were replicas of one cylinder of some very stable metal. And um, every few years, every bunch of years, they would put them together and weigh them to make sure that they are still the same. Um, and if you wanted to know, does your bag of flour weigh a kilogram? The surest you could be is go to one of these and measure it against this cylinder. Of course, um, you wouldn't just be allowed to do that. But uh, this was a standard and people had to agree firstly on how much that particular cylinder should weigh and secondly what it will be called and they decided to call it a kilogram. Now here we have a picture of the earth and it shows several standards but it also shows several things that are not standards. Those yellow lines that you can see on the globe, the Arctic Circle, Tropic of Cancer, Equator, Tropic of Capricorn, and the Prime Meridian. Some of them are given to us by physics, by stars. The way that the Earth circles around the Sun gives us both the tropics, both the Arctic Circles, and it gives us the equator. So the way the Earth spins that gives us the equator and the poles. Those are a given. We do not have to agree on that. An alien hanging above the Earth would agree this is the equator and those are the poles. They wouldn't call it the same thing, but these are not standards. These do not need agreeing on. The prime meridian, on the other hand, that is a standard. It goes through Greenwich in London. Why? an alien hanging above the earth would certainly not notice Greenwich as a very important place. But that's where the people in presumably colonial times were. And they said, right, the prime meridian will be here underneath my foot. And they enforced it. They made other people agree to it. So the prime meridian, that is a standard. So let's move on. We will be looking at internet standards a lot of the time today, but not only. With standards, we can distinguish de facto standards, industry standards, where there is no formal agreement necessary. There is just agreement by use. And we have um, government standards, consortium standards, international standards where the agreement is much more present, much more explicit. Now, we will be talking about some more of them in this presentation, but I want to mention ISO. Um, that is the biggest international standardization body. That gives us useful standards. BSI, British Standards Institution, gives us standards mainly for Britain, but some of them get outside of Britain as well. DIN, Deutsches Institut für Normung, that um, gives us standards mostly for Germany, but some of them get out as well, and we will see some in a few moments. Let's look at first at an ISO standard. This is from a comic, XKCD, if you don't know it, it's uh, heartily recommended. 
and this is the ISO standard for dates. This is how we should write dates. Not like this, not like this, not like this, and so on. This is the correct way, and if somebody tells you otherwise, they are not following the standard. Next, this is a diagram of paper sizes. Mm -hmm. A0, yay high, so 1189 millimeters, and yay wide, 841 millimeters. Then if we divide that by half, we get A1. Divide that by half, we get A2, A3, A4. A4 is now quite the international standard for paper size. And where did that come from? It's called DIN A4 because it came from the German standards body. And then the world saw it as a good idea and agreed with it. And so many other countries started adopting that. Why do we want such a standard? So that we can build printers with standard sizes and we can feed them the same paper and they will work. Let's look at another standard. This is, of course, the British plug. And it um, not only has the physical shape, but it also has um, these values. So, in Britain, if you plug this into a socket, you are expecting to have 230 volts and 50 hertz of your electricity. Mm -hmm. And that actually matters. So, we can plug this anywhere and uh, our appliances will work. Except, of course, in Europe. This shows the limits of standards. Standards have often a geographical limit. And that limit can be very natural. This it's also we have a different wiring system because we had a copper shortage after the war. That's the main reason. Yeah, we need a, we need a fuse in every plug because ours are wired in a ring and everybody else's is uh, wired in hub and spoke. Ah, so yes, this shows that standards often come out of circumstance. And that's important to realize. Now, uh, still with electricity, we have another standard here. And what I mean here is the bottom of the slide, of course. This bit is standard. There is a standard size for it, and every light bulb that comes with this fitting will fit into every socket that's made for it. So then we can have the old style light bulbs, or we can switch to nice fluorescent power saving light bulbs, or we can switch to nice LED power saving light bulbs. And guess what? Our house doesn't have to change. Our fixtures hanging from the ceiling, they don't have to change. And this is really very important with standards that they enable interoperability. Now, this is going to be a fun bit. I would like you to try to guess the connection between this and that. I'll go back. I'd like you to guess the connection between this horse and this space station. Obviously the connection is this. That horse was the first one on the space station. I like this picture, it's just so funny. But um, that's not it. I won't reveal the connection immediately. I will start with the horses. Horses, for ages now, have been used to drag behind them people and their wares, right? And you can see how these, um, what are they called? These long sticks that uh, connect the horse to the cart, they have to be a certain width apart because the horse has to stand between them and has to be comfortable. So the width of the horse dictates the width of the cart, basically. And then, naturally, the wheels want to be on the outside of the cart, so the wheels are just a bit more than a horse's arse apart. Now, we have all of these um, horses dragging around all of these carts, and we had so many of them some 2,000 years ago that Romans already started building roads with grooves in them, so it would be easier 
for the carts to just go through streets. Those grooves then turned later into rails. Rails were certain width because in the beginning they had wagons on them with wheels but in front of the wagon again was a horse. So rails. And then we got rid of the horses, we replaced them with machines with much greater horsepower. But of course if the rail was already there, we would put the wheels of these contraptions the same width apart. We don't want to dig up all of that uh, rail. So we have rail. Now let's look at Britain, the um, place where rail was um, invented and popularized. And let's say the first line was somewhere between Manchester and uh, a minor city next to it. <laughs> I hope we don't have anybody from Liverpool in here. Now um, that would be the first line and that was quite all right. Then of course the line grows, it expands and somewhere else in the country somebody builds a lovely line between London and somewhere in the west. They were quite far away from Manchester and they thought that a wider gauge of rail would be really useful for stability and for um, just general uh, engineering reasons. Then there was a committee that uh, wanted to decide what the gauge should actually be in case these railways ever meet. But of course they would never meet. They, uh, uh, the country is big and th those railways will never come closer. Until of course they did. What happens then? What happens when we have railways of different gauges? We can do something crazy like this. On one side we will have the end, uh, railway coming from the left, it's broad gauge. On the other side railway, uh, that's narrow gauge. And we can just end them side by side. And the train comes from that side and stops and people change into a train here and everything is reloaded and a new train continues on the journey. And that is how it worked for quite a long time. And that was quite natural. It's um, just the way to do it. But of course, it makes this break quite long and it would be in the sticks. Nobody's interested in being in the sticks. So when rail travel became really popular, but not quite as popular to standardize the gauge just yet, people started um, putting down tracks in dual gauge. And here is a modern example of that. I believe this is a picture from Spain, where until quite recently they still had, I think, broad gauge and then they started introducing European standard gauge rails, trains, and so they just added extra rail on there. And this was quite everywhere, and this is how you can have a multi-standard solution. But of course this is 50% um, more iron on those, um, on those tracks, and of course steel is expensive, so you don't want to do that. You want to dig up the one of those rails and you want all your trains to have the same gauge. So ultimately you actually end up agreeing somehow on one gauge. Now the next thing with railways is they don't often go through nice terrain, they sometimes go through tough terrain this is um, one of the longest, deepest railway tunnels in the world. Or rather, this is looking just out of it, of course. Trains often go through tunnels. And of course, where the components of this space station are built, and where the components of this space station are launched from, are quite apart. So when we build these components, we want to transport them to where we want to launch them. And we do that best on rail because that's safest and more efficient. And often this wants to go through tunnels. Now, how big are those tunnels? 
just enough to accommodate a train. How big is the train? Just big enough to fit on these rails. How big are these rails? Just big enough to fit one horse's arse. That is the connection between that horse's arse and the International Space Station. And it really is all about happenstance, all about uh, circumstances, all about agreement and standards. Are standards a big deal? Now, um, let's have a look at this picture. This is a picture of the docks, I believe, in London some about 100 years ago. And you can see the boats and you can see all the wares in barrels and possibly in uh, sacks and just loose. And all of that had to be somehow loaded and unloaded. So let's have a look at a video. Now, this is people actually moving those sacks from one place to another, from inside a warehouse, presumably. No, actually, this is inside the boat. They are inside the boat. They are putting them under the opening above them so that a crane can lift them. I will move a bit forward so we can see they have ropes and they really hope that none of those sacks fall when they are high in the air. Here we have those sacks coming in. And if you look carefully at that crazy rope around those sacks, it was real danger that this would fall over, that some of those sacks would fall. The people down there had a very dangerous job and it was very slow as well. So this would be the old way of loading things and uh, shipping them. You may have heard of the new way uh, of shipping things, the shipping container. Now this boat is somewhat bigger than the ones we saw in the earlier video in the, and in the earlier picture. And let's see how those containers are moved around. Obviously it is not people lifting them by hand and on their shoulders. So let's have a look at this one. Now, this is real time, taking a container out. And that container, of course, has some 40 feet. So that would be, wait, 40 feet? That sounds a bit short. No, yeah, 12 meters and it's being put nicely on a lorry that's waiting just underneath and i have actually timed it from the moment the crane releases it about mm, three two one about now to the moment the next um, container gets on the next lorry that's a minute and a half that's it. In a minute and a half, we have this ready for a different mode of transport. This completely changed the industry. And you saw the port a moment ago. Our ports these days look like this. We have containers upon containers. And those containers, of course, we have already seen them put on lorries so they can reach where boats cannot. But of course, these containers can also go on trains, even in stacks of two, if, of course, the tunnels in the way permit that. So containers completely changed the shipping industry. Containers are the reason that we can order so many things online and they come in just two or three weeks from around the world for close to peanuts. This is actually cheap. This transformed the world. Standards are quite a big deal. Let's have a look at some computing standards, standards again. What we have here is the standard connector for computers. But of course, you know that this is the outdated one. 
because what we have is we had the type A that was on the previous picture and we had the micro B that was also on the previous picture. This was the USB standard and you may have seen type B connectors on some devices. The A connectors I think have never really caught on. The mini B and micro B connectors they have been the staple for phone chargers for probably most of your lives. So this shows that a standard isn't necessarily one thing but it can be a family of things. And of course then you create converter boxes and this again comes from XKCD this converts absolutely anything but then you once in a while get a consolidation. So this is a diagram from Apple website when they introduced the computers that only have USB-C on them and they showed how this does the job of the power socket and the USB socket and the display sockets and the other display sockets and the other other display sockets. So standards evolve. What are some of the standards involved in the web. Let's start from the bottom here. We have HTML and it has a nice logo even like it needs one and uh, the current version is HTML5. We had uh, HTML then possibly HTML2 I don't know HTML3 was a big thing HTML4 was a real big thing for a long time then other side tracks and HTML5 is the current thing. Doesn't mean that there won't be HTML6? We will see. Now HTML has evolved. Who gave it to us? Somebody called the W3C, World Wide Web Consortium. Now the next standard in the line is HTTP. That's the protocol that gives us HTML and yesterday we saw how the web works and we saw HTTP actually on the wire. We saw what HTTP looks like. HTTP was not created by the W3C, it was created by somebody called IETF and I will get back to them in a moment. HTTP is a network protocol, a high level network protocol for that below or in this slide above HTTP we have lower level uh, network protocols. TCP over IP are two protocols that are part of the same standard, same family of protocols and they give us just bytes on the wire. Now we don't care uh, what kind of wire it is or in fact whether there's a wire in the way at all on the level of TCP IP we care about IP addresses and we care about the order of bytes. That's TCP IP. That too came out of the IETF like HTTP. Finally we have the IEEE 802.11 standard which has a bunch of uh, substandards or new versions and that is our Wi-Fi. That is how we are currently communicating I was talking about bytes on the wire and bytes on the wire but of course there doesn't have to be a wire and guess what TCP IP cares not a little bit whether there's a wire or not. HTTP cares not a little bit whether there is a wire or not and neither does HTML and this is the same as we had with the light bulbs we can bring into our home a completely different light bulb, plug it in and it will work. We can take our lovely light bulbs when we are moving, plug it into our different home and they will work. Now let's look at some of the standardization processes. How does standardization actually work? The main keyword there is consensus. In some standardization bodies this is the whole idea. There is nothing else to it. They get a group of people that hopefully represent the world well enough and make them agree. 
And if they can't agree, they spend more time trying to agree. And if they still can't agree, we have no standard. That is the guiding principle of the W3C. It really strives to get consensus. Now, that goes through a whole lot of stages. We have proposals for new standards, uh, sorry, new standard work. We then have, we form the committee. We, uh, the committee discusses things and creates working drafts, then publishes something, mm -hmm. then shows it to the world. The world comments and brings uh, and changes in. And after years, we might have an agreed standard. Consensus takes a whole lot of time. Now, I have been mentioning the W3C and I have mentioned the IETF, Internet, Internet Engineering Task Force, which has a different guiding principle. Also has consensus at the center, but it's only rough consensus and running code. The groups there operate similarly. Somebody has to propose something and, uh, and they see if it can work and they discuss it. However, if they have code, if they have programs that implement the standard and they interoperate and they work well enough, well, that just might be good enough. And often in the W3C, good enough is not good enough for them. But in the IETF, often it would be. Now, HTML is actually uh, something called a living standard, which is a new invention. We will see in a few years if it even works, uh, which is um, very much inspired by the idea of rough consensus and running code. HTML is being developed by people involved in creating browsers. So Microsoft is there, Google is there, um, Apple might be there. Uh, Mozilla is there and uh, and they talk and they see what they can implement. What they can't implement doesn't get in the standard. What they can gets in the standard even if it's rough and sometimes suboptimal. Right. There is a big important distinction. Uh, sorry, there is a big important term, open standards. Not every standard is open. How can a standard not be open? You could imagine, and uh, you would be absolutely uh, justified in expecting that, that standards like laws should be freely available. If something is a standard, then um, we should all be able to see the text and we should be able to implement that standard. However, that's not always the case. Many standards are free to access, but some are available for purchase. ISO standards, and I mentioned the date format, and I, uh, and I think the A4 uh, paper size and all of that family, um, they have become ISO standards. ISO standards are for purchase you cannot just download a copy of the definition of the standard. You have to pay a body in Switzerland a whole lot of Swiss francs and then you get a copy of the standard. That sounds just ridiculous, but that is the old way and I think they justify it by saying that it helps them cover their running costs which, yeah, maybe, sorta, kinda, who knows. The W3C, the IETF, they are completely not like that. All of their work is public and free available online. Now, there's another point about open standards, which is, if you know what the standard is, can you implement it? And, with the W3C, the answer is hopefully yes. With the IETF, the answer is usually yes. With ISO, they don't have an answer. Sometimes companies have patents and those patents give them uh, often worldwide monopoly on a technology. Nobody can implement it without paying that company a licensing fee. That licensing fee is called royalty. 
Standards often are royalty free. So you can implement a standard. For example, you can make your printer uh, the right size so it accepts A4 paper. And you can do that for free. You don't have to pay anybody for it. But sometimes standards will not be <coughs> free, even to implement. And then, BC, sorry? Obviously, BC once famously claimed they owned the patent on a hyperlink. <laughs> because they discovered in all of their various acquisitions that they did ind indeed own a software patent for it. However, thankfully, it wasn't enforced. Wow. So patents can be ridiculous. They can also be quite sensible, actually. Um, they do have a place in the world. But uh, what we have here is, sorry, go right back. What we have here is if a company has a patent that is required to implement a standard, it can be a permitted situation, but then, hopefully, the standard is published under reasonable and non-discriminatory licensing conditions. So the company with the pat patent or patent um, agrees that it will license it to everybody who asks for a reasonable fee. Now, of course, these are not specified, so what reasonable is might differ. Uh, so it's very likely that you and I would be um, economically unable to implement some standards because A, we can't afford a copy or B, we can't afford the fees for the patents. Lovely. Standards are not fun. Now let's conclude with a list of some web-related standards. Let's look at these. I already talked about TCP IP. It comes out of the IETF. It's really rather old. It's called Standard 7 by the IETF. So it's that old. Um, it's Internet standards. So it's only in the age of Internet. And this gives us low level network. HTTP also comes out of the IETF. It doesn't actually get a standard number. It's just something called request for comment, which is a bit of a joke because it's a standard. We have PDF. That is a proprietary standard that came out of a company. Adobe created this standard and they just said, OK, everybody can download our software and use this file format. And then people started to create their own software for this file format. I think Adobe wasn't happy with that for a while, but they gave up. And now PDF is a well accepted web standard but it's still tightly controlled by Adobe. So if they want to change it, they can. Of course, the world could revolt, but that's a different story. So this is an example of a proprietary standard that doesn't, that didn't get formal agreement through a committee. Indeed, this is a de facto standard that just everybody started using it. And yeah, it's good enough. Doc or DocX. That is another case of a proprietary standard comes out of Microsoft, except it's not documented. I'll go back here. This defines what PDF is. Microsoft don't define anywhere what Doc is. And yet but they do define what DocX is. That was the difference between the two standards. Um yes, but it's so complicated. So yes, that's why I'm mentioning Doc here, not DocX because it did become a standard. Everybody was sending around doc files, even though uh, it wasn't actually easy to implement it. And uh, so, so this is a kind of sad type of standard. HTML, the exact opposite, completely free, completely well documented. And here's a tool that will validate your standards compliance. So if you have a web page, you run it through the validator and it will tell you, is this following the standard? Here we have CSS, another one from W3C. Now, uh, it's called W3C, but it has W3.org. So uh, yeah, uh, the web is confusing. Then we have JavaScript. And we are not using it in this class, but it's an integral part of the web. This is the language that drives the web pages in our browsers. It's called JavaScript. 
but it's also called ECMAScript because JavaScript used to be a proprietary standard. It used to be just defined by some company somewhere. And then those companies that were involved in it wanted to standardize it. They wanted to have a standard definition of the language. And the effort was taken up by none other than our very own European Computer Manufacturers Association, ECMA, so they, of course, have to rename it. So that's why it's called ECMAScript in the standard. But it is the same language. ECMAScript is the definition for the language we know, know as JavaScript. I talked about IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force. I talked about W3C, World Wide Web Consortium. They are the two main web standard uh, providers. And that concludes our very quick overview or rather journey through a whole bunch of standards. We looked at why standards come into place, how they come into place, how they can give us interoperability such as we can take pieces of the space station, put them on trains, ride them through tunnels, even though even though those were sized by uh, Horace's ass. Um, we have looked at a bunch of examples of standards, internet standards, web standards, but also physical standards. And we looked very early on at the difference between what is a standard and needs agreement, like the prime meridian that goes through Greenwich, and what isn't a standard doesn't need agreement because it's just a physical fact and that is like where the equator is, even though they are both the, merit, the prime meridian and the equator, two imaginary lines on the Earth. Now, uh, I am basically done. I will very much uh, happily accept questions. We will do that on Slack and uh, we will also answer them on Slack. And I will leave you with this XKCD joke. Thank you very much.